we'll get kicked off and you know welcome everyone lovely to lovely to see you all hope you're all coping well in well and i hate saying unprecedented times because it feels like the cliche of 2020 but it's uh it's you know it's there's no better way to describe it i hope you're all coping well during these times and everything's going well in the in your academies um so um for today uh, you know thank, thanks very much for coming along my name is richard angus um head of education partnerships at my tutor um and, and we also have with us um, david hatchett who's the national director for secondary schools at uh, academies enterprise trust so um you know what we'll be talking about uh today um is is looking at how to successfully roll out online tuition uh, at scale and i'll come on to that in a little bit more detail um david's been rolling out uh, an online tuition program with with my tutor for about the best part of three years or so now uh, it's amazing how time flies actually and so has loads of learnings and loads of insights in terms of how best to think about things or some of the stuff that he wishes he knew uh, when they got started so uh, it'll come on to that um in terms of how it's structured um i'll drop you uh you know a bit of a presentation a bit of a chat about my tutor and, and, and who we are and then we'll move on swiftly to david uh, who can give you a bit more insight into the practicalities of running any kind of online tuition program so um in terms of sort of you know why we're here um and this is a little bit of a, a, a recap on the on the agenda there in terms of why we're here i think what we know is that um it's been very chaotic and there are lots of gaps for for students in the, in, in the coming year and in the year just gone and where schools are looking to fill that uh, many of many multi-academy trusts have been made aware of the national tutoring program um, it may be that tuition actually as a trust-wide initiative isn't something that they've considered before or you've considered before um, but the national tutoring program has created i think a a position where more multi-academy trusts are looking at this as a scheme but actually might not know where to start or have done this kind of thing before so to give you a bit of an overview on, on what it is just in case you're not aware of it yet um it, obviously this is why it came into being in the first instance uh, i think it goes without saying all the gaps that have been created um but how it works from a my tutor perspective and more broadly across all providers is that the national tutoring program is to to impact key stage three and four um uh schools uh, pupils at secondary uh, and other providers are also able to provide support at year six level uh, in primary so you've got that that's the range that this is looking to hit as a as a as, a, as an initiative um across the board though it's subsidized by 75 percent of the overall cost so uh, it nets out for a three to one provision of, of something like four pounds per student per hour which is why a lot of people are thinking about i think are coming to us for the first time this year um with that with that in mind it's three to one tuition and i think david will speak a lot to to the one-to-one -one side of things as well one-to-one -one is always what we've what we've done it's our it's our bread and butter um three to one is part of this national tutoring program and has its own benefits um, but can be applied in different ways the scheme is 20 uh, 15 hour blocks so that for most schools that'll work out as 15 weeks um, and we're an approved tuition provider both for at home and in school uh, learning so um, schools can kick off their, their programs anytime from now. It takes about three weeks to set up. Um, and what we'd recommend is starting on a per academy basis with you know, 30 to 60 pupils um, per school. Um, so before I go any further with that on the National Tutoring Programme, that's just a bit of an overview. Um, I think it, it might, a question might have popped up there, but also if you have any questions at all during the course of this programme, uh, just drop a note into the Q&A box um, and at the end we'll have some time um, for David and I to sort of go through some things. I think some of the practical tips, it's a really good opportunity to sort of ask about some of that nitty gritty stuff. So. Uh, in terms of how schools use uh, online tuition at Key Stage 4 and 5, I think, you know, the, the thing about my tutor is we're, we're all delivered online and the whole part is it, it's been delivered online. And, and so that means you get the right tutor regardless of location. So um, that's the main thing, first and foremost. If you're a, if you're a, a trust that's nationwide like David's, uh, it doesn't really matter. If you're a trust that's more localized, you're not limited by the supply in the local area. Um, you also get to deliver sessions at any time. And usually this is, to be honest, it's an in-school provision, even though it's been online, it's typically been run as part of the school day. Um, but you have the flexibility to take place wherever. So it can be really resilient to lockdown and, and, and bubble isolation. At the moment, we're, we're still delivering programs as normal. Uh, and every session is recorded, which means that session tutors can, students can go back and re-watch those sessions again and again. 
In terms of our tutors, they're all deliberately chosen to be studying at university or recently graduated. And that's for a couple of reasons. So the first thing is, you know, they need to be smart. So they've got great grades at school uh, and they've gone on to university studying a related subject. But that doesn't make you a good, that doesn't make you a good tutor. That just makes you smart. Right. So beyond that, we have to make sure they're up to standard. So every one of them gets a one to one interview. Uh, they also go through a 16 module training course, which we've designed with teachers and teach first to make sure they're on curriculum and can actually deliver the content in the right way to uh, to the students. But then what you get is all the other benefits of their age. So they're closer in age, they've got recent exam experience. Recent exam experience this year will provide less immediate uh, support, but those students are still going to be going through whatever format of exams comes around at the end of the year. And so that's still really beneficial. But they're also closer in age, which provides a really nice alternative angle to what goes on in school. So it's always designed to be a complement. I'm sure David will speak to how it's built into to what they do at AET, but it's not supposed to be a replacement by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, in terms of what sessions look like, I'll send you a video. We've just got a new cracking video, but essentially it looks a little bit like this. So you can see and hear each other in the top corner, but the idea is it's a live interactive session. So tuition is, is I think you'll see from the, the EEF's toolkit, tuition can only be beneficial where it's, uh, it's live, it's interactive, it's an engaging process, and that's what it's designed to be. On the left-hand side, you've got a big interactive whiteboard where students can upload things like past papers uh, and work through that. Usually what we'll do is, is we'll work with your heads of departments and, and, and at, at the academy level to use QLA information to pinpoint exactly the right things to be covering. And that's really important and, and what this space is supposed to be used for. In terms of progress, um, every September we do an impact report. And obviously this year um, was an interesting year. And so we've done a bit less on that uh, because the results weren't necessarily um, you know, standardized across the board as we know. But we've done this for the last three or four years and it's pretty consistent. What we do is we take a student's starting grade, so their mock assessment data before they go into a MyTutor um, tuition program. And we take that, compare it to their end grades, and then we compare that subject, so let's say they got my tutor in maths, we compare their progress in maths against their progress in English and science where they didn't get my tutor. Um, it's, it's a pretty good system because it controls for a lot of things around student motivation, parental factors, all that kind of stuff. What we find is that students typically make about a grade of progress, um, something like two and a half times the cohort uh, control group. And between 10 and 15 sessions seems to be the, the right sweet spot for that. The minimum of 10 seems to be where we get the impact there. That's a commutative thing. In terms of when people actually use online tuition, this is an interesting thing about multi-academy trust. When we first started working with Academies Enterprise Trust, for example, David will remember we had a chat in sort of February, March time. I think that was right. Um, what tends to happen is that later on that becomes more strategic and built further into the start of the year. Where it's there, it can be really deliberately implemented. I mean, this year we're doing a lot more gap filling and a little bit less consolidation as you might expect. Um, but you can deploy it in a really strategic way the closer to the start of the year it is because you can choose almost where that is, whether it's, you know, it's less remedial in that respect and it's more strategic. Um, and there's lots of different ways you can do it. We typically work with exam year students um, for, for a lot of what we do, um, but increasingly as time goes on, we tend to look to, to other year groups who will need support. Um, just the last bit on pricing, I think this is this is probably useful. This is what it looks like for an academy when they approach on an academy by academy basis. So um, anywhere between 22 and 26 pounds an hour for one to one tuition. Um, and we typically say 10 sessions uh, to 15 sessions is the right amount there. That can be um, multi academy trusts can secure much better rates across the board when there's a sort of centralized effort. And that doesn't mean um, a central agreement that the trust is, 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 is funding. It can, it can be done in a bunch of different ways. We have trusts that um, you know, share this out with their academies and the uptake dictates how the pricing works. But the idea of grouping it together um, can have a really good effect there. Um, that's less true on the national tuition program, which is uh, fixed, but hopefully the 75% subsidy, subsidy from the government um, provides uh, a, a, you know, a, a reasonable uh, price for the investment there. So that's how the three to one works. Happy to share any details on that as well, if that's, that's relevant.
I think the last thing to say is that we, we work with trusts of all sorts of sizes um, and in all sorts of ways. We work with trusts that, that work much in a much more distributed way and, and, and rely on, on, on academies to make, you know, to choose in their own way. We work with some that decide strategically this is the right way to do things and then work that through the schools. We, we work with, with trusts in a heap of different ways. And so um, we know every one of them is built quite differently. Um, so that's that's a little bit of warbling from me in terms of you know what my tutor is how it, how we tend to work with multi academy trusts um but what i wanted to do now is 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 introduce david hatchett so um thanks very much for for joining us david um you know he's had a, he's been working with us for the last 3 years or so now and has some great insights in terms of how best to go about running this kind of thing from the first instance so um david would you um do you uh, do you want to share your own screen for this Yes, please, Richard. Perfect. And, and good afternoon, uh, colleagues. Th th thank you um, for joining this webinar. And, and just, just to say from the start, um, uh, for the record, that I'm not employed by my tutor. I have no association with my tutor. I, I was just really keen to share with, with you some of the, the lessons that we've learned through implementing an online tutoring uh, delivery for the last 36 or so months um, and, and really crystallize those into four or five sort of key learnings that I certainly wish I had known when I first embarked on a, a tutoring program at scale. So, so that's sort of what's that's informed uh, the slides I'm about to, to share with you. I'll try and go through those at pace so that we can have some interaction Richard and I can have some interaction and, and respond to some of the themes that, that, that you raise uh, in terms of some of the detail. So I hope that, that that sounds okay. I'm now going to try and share slides with you. Um, and if one of the, my tutor colleagues could just confirm that that's visible. Looks good, thanks David. No, it's brilliant, super. So um, just to give you a very brief context of uh, Academies Enterprise Trust. Uh, so we're one of the largest multi-academy trusts in England. Uh, you, you may well have come across us in the past. The organization has had a fairly checkered past, um, but is now very much on a transformational journey of improvement. We've got 58 schools um, all over England from Middlesbrough in the Northeast uh, down to the Isle of Wight in the south, and we've got presence in a number of major towns and cities. Most of our schools are in areas of uh, relative disadvantage. 21 of our schools are secondary age, and um, about half of those have got uh, post-16 provision in place. We've got five special schools as well, and the remainder uh, are primary. And there's some other information there about um, our learners and staff. Just very briefly, I mean, th this is all information that you, you will be familiar with and, and will have dealt with in your, in your own contexts uh, and, and, and maps. But uh, we were rather fortunate at AET in that, first of all, we have um, a long-standing strategic relationship with Google. So we are Google's um, largest education client in Europe. Um, and have been using the infrastructure that comes with Google in terms of Google Meet, Google Classroom and so on for, for some considerable time. So that certainly helped us to get into a remote learning environment very early on in the pandemic. But alongside that, um, our trustees signed off um, £2 million worth of investment into uh, laptop devices and uh, Wi-Fi for students, to for disadvantaged students. To use at home. This was considerably before the DfE um, program went into schools and, um, and we got that kit out by April which if you, if you think we're now getting towards the end of January 2021 in another lockdown um, that was a fairly rapid deployment of, of some significant resource. So we wanted to be confident that all of the good provision that we were putting on centrally in terms of live lessons, but also in terms of what we expected the schools to be providing, that the students actually had the technology uh, and capability to access that. 
So a bit about the AET and my tutor relationship. And, and, and I guess one of the key questions would be, why did we choose uh, my tutor over perhaps more traditional tuition uh, models? And I think there were, there were two key factors when we looked at this as an executive team. The, the, the first, which you will have picked up from the slide Richard shared on costings, um, is that online tutoring using undergraduates is significantly more cost effective than it would be if it was a traditional tutoring model. Um, it's not uncommon, as, as you will all know, to, for, for hourly rates to be between 35 and 40 pounds an hour for, for GCSE tuition uh, and potentially more than that for A level. We also like the fact that the tutors were undergraduate students typically at um, red brick universities and, and we we saw advantages there in terms of uh, in terms of two key key principles really the first is the age gap was relatively small between the key stage four students and the students at university and we also found that that led to in the best cases some really sort of good um, working relationships during the sessions uh, my tutor were flexible in terms of us using those sessions to also deliver some other key messages that we wanted to get across to students um, a, a, as part of our multi-academy trust. The safeguarding element of tutoring is also robust because every lesson is recorded and that serves two purposes. First of all, it means that in the you know extremely unlikely event that there are any issues that would require investigation, uh, you as senior or executive leaders have a record of the lesson but probably more importantly for the child there is the option to go back and revisit the explanation the demonstration of the tutor uh, for, for, for reinforcement or revision purposes so so we used my tutor from the spring term of 2018 and at that point, um, I had just taken up post and it became apparent very quickly when I did my visits all around the country that if we didn't do something pretty urgently, then the results would be going off a cliff edge uh, in terms of particularly the, the, the basics, the English and maths. So we had to do something drastic. Eight of our schools, eight of our secondary schools, about a third of the secondary estate had been below the floor standard the previous year. Um, and 55% of the schools were either requires improvement or inadequate. So those sorts of indicators will give you an inkling into uh, the, the, the position of the trust at the time. So we had to get something deployed very quickly. And we decided as a trust that we would fund that entirely in the first year because of uh, the fact that the budgets were, you know, we, we were a good third of the way into the academic year. We chose 12 secondary schools that were at risk of having the lowest attainment and of those 12 schools, we had just under 450 students participating in the program. And nearly all of those were year 11 students. We then did an evaluation exercise, uh, which my tutor uh, carried out based on management information and data that we shared with them in terms of the outcomes that were achieved that summer. And we did a lessons learned process to try and understand how we could make better use of, of that tutor tuition and I'll, I'll cover some of that in in one of the later slides but if we fast forward to the present day uh, we've now got 1800 of our students across our secondary schools taking part in the my tutor tutoring program we i think we conducted just over 40,000 hours of tuition last year and with each year of implementation we've broadened the scope of the tutoring as well so as I said, when we first started this, it was very much revision, catch up, exam cramming for, for, for English and maths in the first year. We now have a tuition programme in place uh, in year nine. The core programme remains in, in year 11. We've also just introduced a key stage five programme in, in particularly in, in specialist subjects. And we're also using uh, my tutor to deliver the NTP element the three to one tutoring in um, the secondary schools. We have a slightly different offer in our primaries. So in terms of measuring the success and impact of, of the tutoring, the, the, the first point there 
is that we now look at student attendance to sessions in in as close to real time as possible and, and i think this would be a key salient point i'd draw out to colleagues that i wished we'd introduced earlier so um we are provided with um, attendance and engagement data from my tutor on a fortnightly uh, basis and the intention is just to reduce the wastage of, of of lessons when we reviewed our first full implementation year the, the there's a wastage rate if you like was was approximately i think 20 percent, richard uh, from what i recall uh, which is a, an awful lot of lessons that have not been realized and also a lot of financial resource that, that wasn't being maximized so we were very keen to make sure that we had a good oversight of attendance and engagement this year so that's one of the aspects that we use to measure real-time uh, success of the program my tutor did a review at the end of the first year using our our, our data um, and that showed you've got you've got the information there there in front of you that that showed in a, in our particular case uh, an increase of uh, 0.9 of a grade so just under a grade from the mock baseline in the subjects that the students received one to one or small group tuition in and that compared to a point you know just under a half a grade gain from mock exam to final result in those subjects that that weren't tutored. But we also wanted as an organisation, and our trustees were very, very keen to have a, an external evaluation as well. We wanted to conduct a uh, commission, uh, an external um, evaluation of the of the impact as well. And we, we used an organisation called Impact Ed, which some some of you may may be familiar with. If not, I'm happy to share with you their their contact details if that is if that is of use. They are a research and evaluation organisation. And they looked at the, the data independently. Uh, they looked at the mock baselines for us and they concluded that in English, which is one of the, the tutored subjects, um, the, the impact of the tutoring was represented between uh, a third and half of a GCSE grade in terms of impact. And that we were reaching statistical significance in mathematics as well. So we had a good secure evidence base to recommission um, the the tutoring supplier into the into the third year. So in terms of how we manage the large scale rollout with our schools, remember we've, we've got 21 secondary schools that we were trying to engage in, in this. I think the first point I would draw your attention to is to really make the case for why tutoring um, can make a difference. And you know that was initially for us was was on the basis that you know the results our, our mock examinations were suggesting that the results were going to be really poor and we've got to do something urgently about this but i think three years later with, there's now a substantial amount of evidence base there's the eef uh, impact analysis as well to suggest that tutoring when deployed uh, effectively can actually have a significant impact so getting everyone on board as to why we were were going down the the route that we were going down was really really important the, the second is actually having an, a launch, an official launch to the tutoring program, particularly when you're doing it at scale. And a, a reflection of mine would be that because of the pace we had to implement this in the first year, we had to launch it by by email. Um, we had to send out a communication saying this is what is happening. This is why it's happening. And, and, and sort of please work with it. And I, and I think in hindsight, particularly given the, the level of investment that you would be making uh, into the program that your schools would be making, actually having a face-to-face -face launch event, making a big deal of it, obviously virtually at the moment, but nevertheless, where you can see people um, is something that I would, would strongly recommend. The, the, the next point is about agreeing the priorities for tutoring. And there's been some movement on that in our trust over time as our schools and the leadership of our schools has become more effective. In the first year, we were very clear to set out to my tutor what the priorities would be and how we would like the tutoring to be delivered, which was effectively year 11 students in English and maths that were most behind given their starting points. As the programme has matured and as the leadership of the schools has improved over the uh, two to three years of the programme, we give more scope now for schools 
to determine the exact uh, priorities for tutoring in their in their context. Indeed, one of the best practice tips is is actually having really good communication channels between school teacher and tutor so that the sessions are being used not just you know broadly in english and maths but that you're pinpointing at child level the the areas of misconception that you want the input to focus on or the topics that have been missed or where there are gaps in in learning on the funding note and i appreciate that that everyone's sort of budget situation is is different some of you are from large multi-academy trusts like aet some of you are from more smaller uh, groups or clusters of schools and, and others may be in in local authority context but we felt strongly as a large map that we needed to fund the tutoring um, directly from our central funds in the first year because of the um, because of the timing but also because of the need for for pace and implementation for years two and three we've gone down a 50 50 model so uh, we we subsidize significantly the cost of, of the tutoring which means that schools are paying uh, in the one-to-one -one scenario something in the region of 10 11 pounds an hour which is obviously significantly lower than the than the traditional rates of of one-to-one -one tutoring we also build that into our budget planning process so when we look at our schools um, finances for the year ahead there is an expectation that schools have a budget line for this so that it is not unexpected expenditure and although we set the overarching priorities for tutoring in terms of year groups and disadvantaged pupils and so on, as I say, there is significantly more scope now for schools to deviate and, and agree the detail with the, with the organisation and the tutor. So what, what are the sort of four key sort of salient points I would, I would want you to sort of gain from our, our sort of three years of experience? The, the first is to pick the, the students carefully get the right students on the program where you where you feel you can make the hugest impact and inevitably and we found this as a trust you you want to offer it first and foremost to students uh, in greatest need and the disadvantaged and, and and vulnerable and that absolutely was the decision we took but what i would caveat on that is that that there is some form of assessment of the student's um, ability to engage long and willingness to engage in a long term tutoring program. Because, you know, signing them up and then getting, you know, absence for 80 percent of the sessions is, is a it's a waste of resources. And also that could be used for other borderline students or other students that may, may not be disadvantaged in the traditional definition that we we use, but would benefit from the from the additional input. So, so think carefully in terms of groups of students, but also their willingness or their likely willingness to uh, engage in a, in a program like one-to-one -one tutoring. And then the second point is about picking the right leaders at both school and trust level. And what our experience over the last three years has taught us at AET is that at, at school level, your best bet is to go for a really keen and aspiring middle leader, sorry, a keen middle leader that is aspiring to senior leadership in the not too distant future. Someone that um, champions the, the, the advantages of the one-to-one of -one tuition uh, and, the, and the solution that my tutor offers in, in, in this particular case. Getting that person right was absolutely pivotal to increasing engagement and attendance attendance to lessons in our trust. If you're part of a, a group of schools, either a MAT or a, a federation or a collection of schools, we also recommend that you choose a senior member of staff within that organisation to work alongside a senior uh, member of the supplier, the my tutor team. So in my trust, I lead on all of the conversations around the commissioning, the procurement and the day-to-day -day management of the contract directly with Richard. And I think having those senior communication channels on a regular basis is, is really important to making sure that the programme is on track. It also gives you an escalation route, route to use where things aren't working out. And it happens, you know, we get situations where students turn up and there isn't a tutor there, it's very rare, um, but you, you need to be able to sort of escalate those things directly to, to, to my tutor. 
the third point really is is about having selected who you think the right students are is keeping them engaged and keeping their attendance high and this is something that we've had variable success at in in the first two years um so what what we do now and you know this may or may not work in your context but we are using the concept of a leaderboard to uh, in, increase uh, sort of internal competition between schools and schools in turn incentivize that for students so every two weeks um, effectively a league table is sent out of all 21 schools which shows their their current position where they were last week uh, or last fortnight the number of students in the tutoring cohort which is really important in terms of um, acknowledging how well a particular school has done or how, how much of a concern a, a school lower down might be uh, and the direction of travel and the, the feedback to that has been really positive the schools like it they obviously all want to be in the top five top ten um, so it has introduced a level of competitiveness but in the best case scenario schools then pass that on to the students uh, and, and have rewards certificates and so on and so forth in place to to incentivize uh, attendance on a one-to-one -one basis. The other strategies that we've found useful in terms of keeping engagement and attendance high are things like, you know, whole school assemblies, which are obviously being delivered virtually at the moment. Um, engagement with parents and carers is absolutely crucial, and that that is what we've got down as the, as the fourth lesson. Um, we we have found that having a dedicated newsletter or some form of communication, letter, email, text increasingly between the school or trust and home in relation specifically to the tutoring programme really helps. Um, and what, what we do is we, we remind parents of um, how important the resource is. And we often use analogies of what happens in the independent sectors and private sectors in terms of pupils having access to one-to-one to -one tutor, tutors and how this for them is, is obviously free. Uh, free of charge. There's a link at the bottom of the screen, which I imagine you probably isn't a hyperlink on yours, um, but we'll send that round in case you you want to see that article. That this is a piece I wrote for Schools Week uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, sort of summarising much of what we're we're going through now. So finally, um, that that's just really a summary of of everything we we've talked about, plus a plus a few other other tips. Um, I, I think it all is, should read as, as self-explanatory. But um, for everyone. Thanks, David. Um, I think I just froze there for a minute, but I think you'd just finished up in that 10 seconds where I was frozen. Um, so I'm just going to dive into a few questions now, if that's OK. Um, and I'll, I've got a couple for that probably more tailored um, for you, David versus Rich. Um, but I'm going to start off with those now. Um, and also um, to everyone who's listening, please do drop any questions you've got into the chat or the Q&A just while we're going through. Um, OK, so to kick things off, um, someone has asked, Rich, uh, can Teach First trainee teachers sign up to be tutors? It's a really good question. and I saw it and um, I'm not I'm not totally sure. I think that I'll, I'll double check. I think the, the the rationale, what normally happens is that once someone has moved on from a university environment, we still require tutors to, you know, they take, uh, it requires a certain amount of time and dedication um, to this process when it's going through. And so what we naturally find a lot of the time is that when someone is in training for another job or they move on to a new job, they're no longer necessarily totally appropriate for for, for taking on tuition uh, and so what we do sometimes get is we find that people transition from being at university to being a new graduate but not necessarily having a, a permanent home and they can be some of our best tutors so that's how we can often end up with say a teach first trainee uh, still still providing tuition with us i think in the main 
um, the vast majority of our, our tutors are still uh, in some form of full-time education. Thanks, Rich. Um, and David, it'd be interested. It'd be interesting to hear from you, with the sort of pandemic context. Um, has this changed sort of AET's approach to selecting students or to selecting interventions? Is there anything that you've had to sort of drastically change because of, of COVID um, in terms of selecting pupils for interventions? D definitely. Um, so, so it's widened, I think, the, the, the group of students that we look at. Our emphasis has always been on students that are the furthest behind. Um, and, and I think prior to the pandemic, that was traditionally looked at in terms of distance between current grade and, you know, a, a pass, a, a grade four or above in English and maths. And I think we've, we've sort of widened that now to, to, to look at things far more in the round. Those students that have been particularly hit by the pandemic from a, a sort of social or, 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 or sort of mental health perspective. The, the other thing I would add to that point to that question is um so is how we use my tutor more flexibly now as well as a result of the pandemic so prior to the lockdown typically the tutoring sessions would take place during school hours uh, or certainly on the school site that's where we found the impact to be greatest particularly where students may not have may not have had access to the the, the technology or the working space at home Obviously, now we're in the sort of lockdown process. We have we have no choice on that matter for the majority of students, bar those that are still attending. And so what we've seen is the tutoring used far more flexibly, which is a real positive. So, so you know, tutoring lessons in the evening, tutoring sessions at weekends, tutoring sessions during school holiday closure periods has become far more common because students are used to using the technology at home now for their live lessons as part of their, their normal school day. So I think what it's done is, is it's extended the period of time that students are learning, which, which I think is a positive. That's really helpful. Thank you, David. Um, I guess related to that, um, a lot of teachers at the moment um, are concerned about sort of screen fatigue, kind of everyone spending so much time on the computer and, and the toll that that can take. Um, AUT, is there anything that you're doing to alleviate that in terms of your timetabling and the way that you're structuring the, the remote learning? Just interested to hear about the trust approach. Yeah, so we, we do follow um, a school traditional school timetable. We, we made the decision early on that we thought we felt that was important to the structure of the day. So students' timetables do typically resemble the timetables that they would have had in school. Um, but in terms of what we do to sort of demarcate the day, um, so we, we make sure that there is an, a, an assembly, you know, a, a, a collective opportunity for students to see their peer group and um, once a fortnight their, their entire cohort. We make sure that there are break periods in between each lesson rather than just twice a day, although they, 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 are, they are short. Um, so we've made some we've made some modifications to that, but we felt it was really important that the the on the, the remote learning day resembled a normal school day as much as possible in terms of hours of working and who the, who the students were were seeing. Thanks, David. Um, so this is a question that could be worth um, maybe both of you weighing in on. Um, uh, so this is from Richard Hurst, who's asking, um, given that the position of exams is still unclear and, and we haven't sort of had, you know, 100% clarification on, on how assessments are going to be done this year, um, how are sessions being tailored to students' needs, really? Um, and Rich, maybe you can talk about that, because obviously you mentioned that usually our programmes are, are focused on exam sort of preparation. And um, how, what does that look like this year? I can certainly give my perspective and then I think it, it would also probably be useful to get David's perspective on, on how schools are, are thinking about gap filling. I think, you know, look, this year is, it's a, this year and last year, very different in terms of what's, you know, whereas last year in our first lockdown, it felt like a lot of it was, this, you know, okay, exams were cancelled, but also, you know, you're at consolidation phase in many respects for, for the top end of GCSE, whereas this year there are, there are gaps to be filling, to be filled. 
what we're finding is that schools are largely um, re-evaluating and checking QLAs. There are a number of gaps and so it's about prioritizing which ones that they want to focus on in this period uh, and for what year groups. So I think what we're finding is that exams, it, it creates a, it's, it's currently created a bit of a wider bucket of areas that, that, that they, they want students to focus on, but aligning it with what's also being provided on an online perspective and um, with their own school provision uh, and just trying to keep it as pinpoint on those areas of most concern um, is useful and, and hopefully as well as the rest of the year goes on we'll get more data around um, gaps and things for for students so um, for year 11 not a not a great deal of change in terms of how their their approach is taken but for earlier year groups um, they're, they're sort of thinking about the, the buckets of, of areas to fill, I suppose. I don't know, David, if you have anything to add to that. I think you know, it's a good question, Richard. Um, what I would say is that we've approached this differently this year to last. So last year, um, when, when the first lockdown kicked in, kicked in in March, because of the nature of the guidance from Ofqual, which was, as you'll recall, uh, back last year, was for teachers to assess uh, assuming that students had finished the course and taken the examination. So there was an element of prediction involved in that. Um, and, and so we made a decision as a trust to move quite a large proportion of our uh, tutoring allocation from year 11 to year 10 at the March, April point. Um, I, I think looking back, that was probably the right strategic decision because of course year 10 have been more significantly impacted by lockdowns relative to the length of key stage four than last year's um, year 11. However, this year, what's interesting in the off-qual consultation that's on at the moment is that, um, that this element of prediction is not expected this time uh, and that teachers will be required to assess against a standard uh, as late as possible. So for that reason and the relative impact that year 10 have suffered from two lockdowns, we've made a decision to continue the tutoring programme with year 11 students largely not exceptionally but largely um, and and we're doing that because of the knowledge deficits and the fact that this this cohort of students will be you know many will be going on to a level and other programs post 16 where you know the likelihood is that examinations will return so we want to make sure that the knowledge is covered in full rather than the exam cramming and exam preparation that we would have used the tutoring for in the past i hope that's helpful Thanks, David. Um, so I know a, another sort of concern um, that we hear quite a bit is around disengagement. So and particularly now um, with COVID and at home learning and it being much more difficult to kind of um, motivate students. Um, when a student does disengage, um, what options with my tutor are there to to tackle that issue and, and to maybe swap pupils or it'd be great to hear from Richard. How are we approaching that at my tutor? So I think to to David's point, there's lots and lots of ways to to try and you know keep students engaged from from their home environment, and we know that it's a it's a different challenge to to what goes on in in the school day and as part of the school day. Um, there are a bunch of different initiatives that that go on. I think you know this at the moment like really securing parental engagement and and we've had some really good examples of, of different ways to do that so david mentioned a newsletter actually one of the aet academies ride they send a video um and actually that was some of that was based on the literacy levels of some of the parents and it was a more engaging way to share that that piece of engagement which is really really neat um having some competitive element during this period is also proving quite a boost for a number of schools where you know, it can be there are there are less tools to, to to motivate students to be engaged, and where, you know, I think that the the mandate is that it's really really important to keep providing this additional support, um, as the student won't be getting it any you know outside of outside of the school environment as and that's the same as it was before, so we're not consistently changing pupils um, because of the, the effort levels that are going into engagement but where a student is disengaged from um, the process and, and, and needs a different type of support during this period or, or more generally um, then we make those then we make those changes and sometimes you can't truly know that until you're 
two or three weeks into something um at which time we'll we'll you know we'll make we'll be able to make changes but i think the encouragement is to is to find you know ways to be clever around engagement versus uh, changing those people's out sort of quickly if that makes sense thanks rich um so david one for you um do you want should i just add a dimension to that actually yeah that would be great just, thank just you very, very, just very briefly in terms of such yeah. strategies uh, we introduced the two strikes and you're out rule uh, this year, uh, partly because we, we realised that about twenty percent of lessons were were wasted in the, in 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 the previous year, and we were keen to to, to sort of maximise that, so uh, minimise the wastage. So we've got to accept, regrettably, that some students just will not engage with with tutoring, no matter how you know effective and dynamic the tutor is. You know, thankfully, it's a very, very small minority, but we have to accept that that's the case. And because you as trust or school leaders will want to maximise every pound invested in this, it's really important that we identify students that are not engaging very quickly. Give, you know, in my view, give them the, the, the two opportunities. And then if, if it's still not working to move that allocation of tutoring to another child that, 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 will, that will potentially benefit. So I think having something like that in place you know, whilst you wouldn't want to use it on a frequent basis, is 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 something that's worth keep keeping up your sleeve. The other thing I will say is very occasionally as well, students give us feedback to say that the relationship with the tutor just isn't working. And in those instances, as I said on one of my slides earlier, you know, for you to be able to to speak to your senior representative, senior link at my tutor, and just have the frank conversation. Um, then we get that changed and nine times out of 10, that results in, in things uh, improving. Thanks, David, really useful. Um, last couple of questions, I think, um, from us. Um, so with the mention of, of a sort of leaderboard concept um, among different schools to sort of incentivize attendance and, and performance, has there ever been any downsides to that, um, to that competitive setup, or, or has it largely been very positive? Um, we'd be interested to hear, David. Thank, thank you for that question. Um, we're only into the third uh, round of leaderboards, so we're in the sort of sixth uh, week of, of, of two week cycles. Um, I, I suppose the, the thing to say about any type of leaderboard is there's always going to be somebody at the bottom. Um, and what you just want, what you hope for is that over time, you might still be at the bottom, but the percentage might be significantly higher than, than what it was when you started out. Um, so the, the negatives are largely dealing with the, um, the disappointment of staff uh, and, and leaders in the individual schools that happen to be genuinely dis disappointed. Uh, with their performance but what I've been struck by is that principals head teachers have got in touch with me when those have been issued to sort of typically say we're really unhappy that we're in position 16 we're on to it this is what we're doing if you've got any tips as well we'd like to know that can you, you know, put us in touch with my tutor for, for something and they're using the information to boost their position for the next fortnight so I think as long as you've got you know a tough skin can ride it out it's it, you, there's more advantages than disadvantages to having it in place. The, the only thing I'd add to that is that um, we've had we've had notes from schools from from AET and a couple of other trusts where we do it who have said we want to do this thing, like, but we you know we want to make sure that this this is a different program. We want to make sure that it's it's separated out on the on the leaderboard so it's all fair representation. So at least engagement with it, um, it's, you know, definitely it's a it's an additional lever for sure. So actually that's uh, just to build on that so getting the metrics right for the leaderboard is really important so um when we first introduced it, the first fortnight we got feedback from some of the schools saying are all do all schools have the same number of students on the program and of course the answer is that they they, 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 they don't so what we've introduced now is is bracketed information that puts the school's position into context so you're looking at schools that are rising up the league table that the leaderboard with large cohorts of students on the program. Um, and that's all captured now. We've also got previous positions and cumulative attendance. So as you sort of refine the metrics over time, you get a more, you know, a fairer and accurate representation of how well schools are engaging. 
Thank you. Um, and I think last one, actually. Um, so looking specifically at the national tutoring program um, and the three to one tuition aspect, um, a common sort of theme that comes up is what is the best way to select your trios for those three to one groups to get the best result? Um, and obviously it's quite a new thing because it's the NTP is you know launched pretty recently, but um, keen to hear from Rich and David really. Um, how how how's that working for you, David, um, at your schools and Rich? What what do you, what do we recommend as sort of best approach? So so from an AT perspective, um, the, the NTP program has been something that we've come to fairly late on into into in, into the program of, of tutoring so i think what, what i'd want to do in terms of doing justice to to that um to that question is to, is to go away and get some more information and perhaps share that um with you at that point if that's all right i i think it's too embryonic to be able to to um draw out any particular strengths or weaknesses you know, I think actually, in some ways, it's the same. We, you know, the the, the program launched formally in November and, and started towards the end of the the month. The best advice we currently give is stuff that we just know as some received wisdom from from small group stuff anyway, which is, you know, where you got your trios. Think co quite complementary in terms of learning gaps, so they're going to be focusing on the same. So obviously, you know, same sort of levels, same same sort of place. But also think about the sort of students that really can can do three to one, and and that one of the I suppose one of the, the potential issues with three to one is that you could be in a situation where one one student becomes very quiet relative to the others, and so and that you know it might be a different learning style and everything else, but making sure that however you trio them up there is going to be some you know they're going to work fairly effectively together um and so i think that paying attention to that piece is probably the most important thing because there are far more similarities and there are differences between the two methods um so that's that's like that's early stuff and we wouldn't probably say much more than that at this point it'll be interesting to see come the end of the year where, where additional learnings are Thanks, Rich. Um, so I think that's it um, on the Q&A front. Um, so I'll hand back to Rich to just wrap up. Yeah, absolutely. So look, thanks very much for, for coming along today in the middle of the day. Uh, and thank you very much, David, for, for, for presenting some, some bits from the years that you've been, been working on this. It's been really, really helpful to get your, your insights. Thanks very much for everyone who attended. Hope you found it valuable. Um, uh, apologies if you submitted a question as well we didn't get a chance to read but we'll be following this up with a with a recording um and when you close the window we'll also send you a, just a very quick survey just to see how you found this because we're always looking to improve the way we do it um and also you can flag up there if you'd like to receive an impact report uh, or a general overview of, of my tutor how it works uh, you can say yes in that survey or you can drop us a note here at, at partnerships at my tutor and hopefully there you can get a bit of a sense of uh, any additional questions or thoughts that might have come to mind whilst we're all sort of working things out in this first the first term back uh, for the new year so thanks very much for coming again um best of luck for the for the next few weeks and months uh, and 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 uh, see you all soon sure see you later